Thank you so much for coming on this beautiful summer day in October. And my name is Jerry. This is my colleague Shilpa. We're going to talk about my devices and device compliance at Stanford. And let me apologize up front for the fact that I've been shouting over a table all the morning in a noisy room down the building, and I'm losing my voice. So if I kind of start to think of my response, just bear with me as I drink water and try to recover my voice. And I'm also, I hope that I am heard by whoever is listening on the live stream or might be listening to this uh, in the recorded form in the future. Let me start with just a couple of, there are a whole lot of us here, and I'm guessing if you're here you have some idea of what I'm talking about, but is there anyone in this room who is a My Devices administrator? In other words, you already have administrator access to the My Devices web application. And, okay, so <clears throat> we're not really going to be looking at that a whole lot, so I just, I kind of am wanting to get a sense of, of, of just the composition of that. And are you are the people here mostly IT support or um, just curious? Okay. So if at any point, let me let me say up front that if at any point I'm saying something that is obscure or you'd like me to elaborate on or you just have a question or need a clarification, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. But we're going to try very hard to leave a lot of time for questions and answers at the end of this talk. So I'm going to try to cover what little I have to cover. It's actually a lot, but the point is to, to cover it at a high enough level that it doesn't feel overwhelming. And there'll be plenty of time for us to, to talk about that in my comments. And also, just to kind of prepare you for uh, a question I might ask later, is, is there anybody here who's currently got a problem with device compliance? Actual ongoing problem with device compliance, and you're seeing something from you when you go to my devices. So um, when we get to the, we, if you're willing, at the end of this talk, we might want to use you as an example so that we can troubleshoot the problem together and maybe figure out how to solve your problem, and maybe not immediately, at least, how we're going to approach you. So, let's see. So the reason the reason that we're here, I mean, um, device compliance sounds kind of harsh. It's all about you know, making your computers conform to certain standards imposed by the university. And the reason that that's even happening is about five years ago there was a security incident, and um, the university decided that enough was enough. We needed to ensure that university computers were all encrypted so that when they were stolen from people's cars, as happens all the time, or otherwise compromised, that we have some at least minimum level of assurance that the device, that the data on the device are going to be available to some industry. So this is actually taken from the FAQ on encrypt.stanford.edu. The URLs that I refer to are at the end of the slide presentation, so you don't need to worry about it to be notes on anything. But this is the wording of the encryption mandate in the encryption fact. And basically, it's just if you're going to be using a machine on the Stanford network, it needs to be encrypted. If it's Stanford owned, irrespective of where you're going to be using it, it needs to be encrypted. And if you're going to be ask, accessing high risk data of any sort from any location, irrespective of ownership, the device needs to be encrypted. So at this point, we're really only and verifiably encrypted to that. So for technological reasons, not only just to the limitations of the tools that we have available and the resources we have available to apply to the problem, we can only really verify encryption from Mac OS, Windows, and iOS, and Android. So when you look at my devices, for the most part, those are the sorts of computers that you're going to see. You might have some other things in your list. And again, if you've known the my devices web app, don't worry about it. We'll take a quick uh, look at that a little later. But um, mostly it's just the Going to be, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way for you to see an inventory of the devices that belong to you and their compliance status for present purposes. This is what the device registry looks like. So I've been talking about my, the, my devices, which is really just a web application. It's a front end to the device registry. And this is how people go in and take a look at their computers, or if you're a my devices admin, you can take a look at the computers belonging to the and support. The device registry itself is kind of at the center of all of this. The My Devices web front end is how you look at what is in the device registry. And the information that gets into the device registry comes from a variety of data sources. 
and then there are feed services that take information from the sources and put it into the device web. So, for example, um, just going down the list here, I'm sorry that this is a bit fuzzy. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that is, but I trust that it's readable enough. The feed that we have listed at the top, called Authlog, is primarily information. This is sort of an obscure feed, but it's primarily information regarding, oh, thanks a bunch, William. Um, this, is, this is William and all my colleague who can fix anything. So, uh, thanks a bunch. Uh, that looks way better. Uh, we might have to get rid of move some things around a bit. So, the Authlog feed is basically last. Oh, thanks, Sherpa. The Authlog feed is basically the last seen on network information about your devices. The Big Fix feed, I'm assuming most people here have probably heard of Big Fix. It's the, the management um, service, uh, endpoint management service that we have available as kind of Mac OS and Windows. It, we got it 15 years ago basically to deal with operating system patching and maintenance, but we now use it for inventory purposes and reporting on device compliance. So there's the big fix infrastructure itself where all of the big fix computers with big fix clients on them are checking in and reporting various properties about the devices. That's all in big fix. And there's a data feed that takes and my next slide will cover it a little bit more detail. Um, the data feed takes information out of the big fix back end and <coughs> moves it over to the device registry. And I'll talk about what happens there. So Information from about when your machine was last seen on the network comes in once per day. Information about what's in big fix regarding your computers comes in once every four hours. This matters a bit for people who've made a change and are waiting to see that change reflected in my devices. And you might be paying attention because perhaps you have a non-compliant device and you want it to be compliant. So um, the update period of the does kind of make a difference. It gives you a, a kind of a, a guideline to how long you're going to have to wait between when you've done something and that action is going to be reflected in your devices. MDM is just, that stands for mobile device management, which is kind of a generic term. We're currently using Workspace One, um, previously known as AirWatch from VMware, to manage mobile devices, and that's just iOS and Android at this point. So information about iOS and Android devices gets into the device registry. Um, I believe that's also every four hours, yes. Valor, is a monitoring system that we developed in-house because a number of people were uncomfortable with putting the BigFix software on their computers. Because BigFix is a management tool, it can be used to make changes to people's computers invisibly, and not everybody wants that done. So if a computer does not have this, if it's not going to be used to access high-risk data at any point ever, then the lure is an option rather than big fix. The device can still be compliant. Big fix reports the same properties that are of interest that we get out of big fix. Encryption status, that kind of thing. Encryption status really the thing. The, the unfortunate IED acronym here, that's just stands for initial enrollment data. So again, a lot of you are probably familiar with standard device and game form. You might see it in various contexts if you're going through network self-registration. You have to put in your standard ID, verify your standard ID, very significantly answer a question about will this machine be used to access high risk data or not, and how compliance is calculated is affected by how you answer that question. And just to say a little bit about high risk data, um, it's other people's high risk data. So if it's your own credit card number, if it's your own telephone number, if it's your own social security number, or what have you, Stanford doesn't really care. It's when you're responsible for other people's personally identifiable information that it becomes an issue. So sometimes students get confused on that point and they're trying to be honest and say, oh yeah, okay, my computer accesses social security numbers and credit card numbers, but if it's just your own, that doesn't really matter. So um, NetDB is our networking database. I mean, if you are also, I'm sure, familiar with that. And information out of NetDB is likewise fed into the device registry on an hourly basis. And one of NetDB is information in NetDB is updated infrequently and um, at ill-defined times. So if you're going through Stanford Network self-registration, at that point we're going to be getting fresh data about your computer into the, the NetDB database. We'll have your current MAC addresses, at least what you had. Um, visible on the network at the time of registration. 
uh, the, the machine name at that time, its encryption status, your null terms, and so forth. But once that gets into NetDB, there's generally no automated process to keep those data up to date. So um, for people who do are concerned with, with administering other people's computers and with other people's device compliance, or helping people to troubleshoot device compliance problems, one of the one of the issues that we run into most frequently is stale information in NetDB that needs to be updated. That, uh, a NetDB record can be many years old and can still be attached to a given computer um, in the device registry. And that if old information sometimes confuses the picture. And finally, Red, RedCap here, that's just the name of a, of a database. But what we're using it for is compliance exceptions. So there will always be cases. So uh, one of the most common examples is people need to run a really old version of Windows. Uh, I was just talking this morning with somebody who's um, still using Windows XP to run some, some microscope equipment or what have you. Um, that's increasingly rare, but there are still people having to use quite old versions of, of operating systems, quite old hardware, just in order to run machinery. The vendor might have long gone out of business or what have you. So there needs to be some mechanism for people who simply cannot bring a, a device that needs to be on the network into compliance. You can request a compliance exception. If you just do a, a standard web search on compliance exception, it will take you straight to the form that's maintained by the Information Security Office. They will push back if you don't have a really good reason for needing to have an exception. But, um, and you do have to review the, the exception annually. Any questions so far about this? Yeah. So <clears throat> my question is, um, uh, are these devices uh, re going to this register under a human action? I mean, do we have to connect and, and say, I'm so and so, so please register me? Or is, there, is this an automated process? And if so, are there uh, communication protocols in place that are available across all these devices for you to, to know which device is which and when it is uh, in the network or not? Right. Let me, let me try to restate your, your question so sure. that um, anybody remote can hear it. Are, is there any actual human action necessary in order for these data to get, because I've said something about you know identifying yourself and answering right. high-risk data questions and so forth. Is it necessary for any for human action to take place for these data to get into the, to the, to the device registry in the first place? Or to what extent is this happening in an automated way? And how is it that we fit everything together and, and are we able to see all of this data on, on the back end in order to, to make sense of what we're looking at? The answer is it's sort of mixed. So there are, are a few points at which a user does need to provide some information. So for example, you're first registering your computer for use on the Stanford network. At that point, you do need to say who you are and what the device you use to, to access high-risk data. Your answers go into the device registry and are saved. At that point, you're probably going to be you're going to need to install something like either Big Fix or Velour so that your device can be verified to be able to You might need to run some software that we provide, like the so-called SWAY, S-W-D-E, we all pronounce it SWAY. Stand for stand for whole disk encryption. There's a standard whole disk encryption, a SWAY application that people can use on Mac OS to help with file vault, on Windows to help with blocker encryption. So all of that does involve human interaction indeed, but once the big fix or valor is installed, once the device is encrypted, once you've answered your device enrollment questions, then software like big fix or valor continues to run silently on the computer, checks in periodically. You don't have to be involved at all. You don't have to be paying any attention at all. And anything that might have changed about your computer. And an example of something that changes rather unfortunately often from our perspective, Oh, thank you. The lecture said I can hear you. Oh, dear. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. So uh, I apologize for not having spoken into the microphone a little bit better. Um, now, okay, well, I'm doing better. So, um, but yeah, so once, once all of those bits of information get into the, the device registry, then some magic happens that I'm, that I'm going to talk about next. Did, did, did I sort of address your question? Uh, yeah, in part. <clears throat> Can you? Explain also what the discovery protocol is and do you use that discovery protocol to find out or, or, or not at all? The, yes, do, do, uh, well, the answer is kind of no. Do, do, do we use a discovery protocol? In other words, 
I, I, I think what you're asking is, do we probe the network right, right. for new and unexpected things showing up and yeah. go after them? Not really. If you connect to the Stanford network, you need either the Stanford Wi-Fi SSID um, or else plug into Stanford Ethernet, then if your machine is not registered in NetDB, then our networking hardware will know, okay, we're seeing a MAC address here that we don't recognize, we don't have a NetDB record for it. You get immediately sent over to the self-registration service. So at that point, by virtue of you're not having a network record already for that computer, we know that this is a new computer or one that for whatever reason we don't know anything about, we get forced to go through network self-registration. There are other ways to connect to the network on campus where that's not going to happen, but if you are connecting to the Stanford Wi-Fi network or plugging into the wall, then you're going to be caught by that mechanism and get into a networking database that way. Does that address your yeah. question? Okay. So basically, these these are all systems that people were, were already using anyway, but we wanted to pull all of this useful information together so that we could verifiably or you know determine that, that um, devices on the Stanford network are indeed encrypted. That's basically what this is all about. So you'll notice there are a bunch of different feed systems here. And um, the device registry here, well, what happens when they first come in, at whatever frequency they come in, they go into a front-end um, database, MongoDB, and it's the stuff just kind of sits there. Or it, actually, it doesn't just sit there. As soon as it arrives, the device registry begins going through these new data that have come in and tries to match it up with other information that might be associated with the same device. So there's a whole lot of matching work device registry has to do in order to determine that information coming, say, from NetDB and coming out of BigFix and coming out of Authlog, that's, you know, when the machine is last seen on a network. And evidently, I stated that's not going to be Okay. Um, and a single device is likely um, enrollment data, likewise. So we might have four different feeds representing pieces of a single device. Oh, yeah, thanks, Shilpa. Um, yeah, okay, that's good. And so that's what the, the store feed data is. You're, you're coming into the, the these, these feed, feeds are coming to the device registry, that information is entered into a staging database, and the device registry begins the hard work of matching everything up. And primarily it relies on MAC address services. So that's one of the reasons why it can take a while for the device registry's notion of the device to be synthesized assemble, fit together out of all of these various feed data. And once that device is, device record is, is merged together out of various feed sources, then it's associated with the person. That's information that we got either from your enrollment data. It's the user's field in that you view comes into play. Um, and then once the device, we've got what we believe to be a single device in the real world belonging to a single user. It goes into a backend database, and that's actually what you're going to be looking at when you go into the My Devices UI, is this synthesized device formed out of information from a variety of different feeds and associated with the person based on information that's available to the device registry out of these different feeds. And I'll say a little bit more about how compliance <coughs> is calculated the next slide. Um, just a quick note about BI reports. Oracle Business Intelligence um, is, is available, and you can get reports out of the device registry in Oracle BI. Um, I, we, Shilpa and I don't have a whole lot to do with that ourselves directly, and <clears throat> I don't think a huge number of people use these reports of BI, but they can be really valuable. And if you are using to look at information, about what's going on with a large number of devices sitting in the organization. That's how you're going to want to count it. Um, my advice is, just, is more, for, more suitable to looking at a, a given user's set of devices or troubleshooting a problem with a specific device. So, <coughs> Isn't this a little bit of overlap with what MDN do? There's, this is all about overlap. Yeah, yeah so, so then why are you doing it? Why are we doing it? 
it's because we want to have a single point where we can see information about all types of devices. So if we, now, part of the answer is we don't have an MDM solution for all of the types of devices that we care about at this point. So our MDM service at this point is restricted to um, mobile devices, iOS and Android. So if we had a single unified MDM service, the structure of the feed systems might look a little bit different, but there would still be our networking data. There would still be a moment of information. There would still be data that are outside probably what we would have in the MDM at least initially. And um, we also, so yes, this is built on top of something like a collection of, of services like MDM. Does that sort of make sense? I mean, why are we doing it? Why we are doing it is basically because we were stitching together a lot of different pieces. It's possible at some point a vendor would be able to provide a single product that would do everything that we want to do, but we built this. And um, yeah, so I mean, it seems to be working as well. I thought that's the presenter on this. Okay, so the various, um, these are the device properties that are really um, present in every single feed and that the device registry uses to match things up. And so device name, obviously that doesn't have to be unique. It's anything that a user might have selected. It's what you've given your, in your sharing preferences in Mac or OS or what have you. Device type, again, certainly not unique. Make model, likewise. OS, likewise. And over the various feed systems there, you can have big fix on the computer, Mac OS or Windows, you can have folder on the computer, Mac OS or Windows, but you can't have both. Um, our installer makes it really, really hard for you to put both at the same time. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we don't have an MDM solution for Mac OS or Windows, so it's workspace one for iOS or Android devices. So those feeds are all going to be um, mutually exclusive. And um, the only property that's common to all of these feeds that we've got that's going to be potentially unique and a way for us to identify it on a, a single device is MAC addresses. So we're heavily reliant on MAC addresses to match up devices. In other words, the, the way that we fit together something that's going to look like a single device in my devices is based on MAC address lists out of BigFix, MAC address lists out of MacDB. And that goes back to a point I was making earlier about the, the importance of keeping information in MetDB up to date wherever possible, because that is how we are matching MetDB records up with, say, a Linux record for a computer. And we will see a lot of cases where people will go into my devices and they will see a single device, a single computer of theirs, spread across two different rows. And one of them might be your computer name.stanford.edu, and the other one might be just your computer name. The one that's .stanford.edu is the MetDB record. Device registry has failed to match to the big fix data that's in the other record. And it'll, it'll be you know, big fix data plus the mobile data and maybe some other things. And a lot of times that's happening because the MAC address list in MetDB is not a sufficiently good match with the MAC address coming out of big fix. And the MAC address list coming out of big fix can be variable. So let's say you've got a laptop and sometimes at home you plug it into an Ethernet dongle. In the office, you connect it up to a docking station, or you get up to a display that has an Ethernet adapter. The MAC address that's associated with that device on the network might be different at the different times. And what's in NetDB isn't necessarily going to reflect that unless you took care from the beginning to ensure that the NetDB record included all of the MAC addresses that would ever be associated with that device. Any questions at this point? Oh, and if you're wondering why we're not using serial numbers, hardware serial numbers, which are also really good unique identifiers, the answer is we want to and have plans to from the beginning. I was going back through some of our old documentation, and our vendor was talking about serial numbers five years ago. So there are definitely some improvements that we would like to make that would, would make device matching a little bit more reliable, and problems like the one that I just described, where a single device is spread across what looks like more than one device. I recently saw a case where somebody had a machine split into three pieces, basically. Um, so you go in, you fix net DB records, and you smush some things together, and you might sort of just be angry. Yes? Yeah, I think the title of your talk was the word compliance. Can you explain what, what are the compliance requirements that you have, and 
how you need to? Yes. The principal compliance requirement is that the device be verifiably encrypted. And there are some additional rules depending on who you are. And uh, like if you're in the School of Medicine, there's some extra stuff that you need to do in order to meet. There are more stringent requirements. And um, for the device to be compliant, it needs to be associated with a single binary user with a standard SIMIT ID, a standard university network identifier. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the main thing. If, you're, if the computer is stated to have access to high risk data, it needs to be encrypted, it needs to have big fix installed on it, you can't use Allure, which is a monitoring on the service. And the machine has to be marked in such a way that BigFix knows that it should enforce a handful of settings. One of the most visible is the screen lock by the camera. So if you've got a computer that has access to high risk data, then it needs to be encrypted, and the screen lock idle timeout needs to be configured within certain parameters, and then the device would be considered compliant. So there aren't a lot of variables in play, and it really does boil down to whole disk encryption. This is really what it's about. Yeah, I also want to add on regarding a few things that GS put here, like device type and make and model. So um, it also adds on the, the encryption of who you are in Stanford and what is your device type and are you running the uh, right, uh, sorry, <laughs> are you running the right um, type um, and make and model of the devices? Like it's a Windows machine, so you have to have certain version of Windows running. If it's a iOS, then yes, there is a standard on to at least a minimum version. And you can always run things higher than that. So those are the things which which also uh, add up to compliance. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, as he said, like are you accessing high risk data? Is it your, you know, is uh, is it your personal and Stanford device? And do you have an ADB record associated with it? So those are a few variables uh, depending upon the device type would change. And Added on to that would be who you are in Stanford. Are you a student? Are you a staff? Are you both? Uh, do you also work with a uh, school of medicine? So those are all uh, kind of a few things that would contribute to compliance. And we'll also talk about a little more in a little more detail. Yeah. <clears throat> and that actually, let's see. I wonder what slide I should Oh, I think that's cool. Okay, so um, this actually sort of addresses part of that question. Yes, you have to use a certain kind of encryption, the, the natively available encryption technology for the Mac OS Windows that block your file vault to your phone. And it has to be whole disk encryption. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, and I did talk a little bit about the, the suede settings enforcement which is required for devices with high-risk data access. Shilpa made a really important point that, yes, there are some minimum requirements for operating systems. So uh, Windows XP is basically, unless you've got a compliance exception, forbidden on the campus network. And um, we haven't yet cut off any older versions of Mac OS, but it's probably coming. And um, there are minimum versions for <laughs> iOS and Android as well. It's all about security with the block. So, device enrollment, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about because it's incredibly important. This is how we know that the device belongs to a specific individual. And one of the tricks here is we don't do life cycle management very well. We don't have good tools in place to ensure that when a computer changes hands, for example, that we update all of the information in the relevant places to show that this machine actually belongs to my person. So if you're responsible for administering computers for others, this is something that you really are going to want to pay a little bit of attention to. If the computer goes from user A to user B, you need to have user B run the device enrollment application, um, which is available off of the Stanford web. And uh, you can just search for device enrollment. You go to the IT services, services page, and it's listed under device enrollment. This is a standalone application that will just allow a user to change her enrollment access, for example, without having to run all of the suite encryption software or get this installed or installed. Some of you might know what I'm talking about if you don't have any um, 
and let's the other oh one other variable that I did want to be sure to mention is because this also plays into compliance and enforcement is if the machine is Stanford owned. I mentioned earlier that the, the mandate does specifically say if the computer is Stanford owned, then it needs to be encrypted wherever it wants to be encrypted. So <clears throat> and um, that's another answer that's provided when I when a user gets her answers to um, the device enrollment question. So, and I also did say a little bit before about the importance of keeping net and view records up to date. <clears throat> it's mostly MAC addresses that matter. But one possible gotcha that trips people up occasionally, and if you do a lot of supporting folks with device compliance issues, you already know about this. The operating system can matter. So if, for example, <clears throat> you've got a computer that's in big fix reporting that it's a Windows machine, and the device registry is trying to match it up to a computer that's got the same MAC or roughly the same MAC address list from NetDB, except in NetDB it says it's Mac OS. The match will fail. So even though there's a, a solid match on MAC addresses because the OSs are reported differently, that's considered a non match. The solution is just to go into net because you know big fix is almost certainly if it's reporting the machine as Windows, it's Windows, trust me. Um, the information that in that net you do is wrong, and somebody else needs to go and correct it. Um, so that can cause problems where you have a device records that aren't being properly matched up together, and that can lead to compliance problems because the orphaned record might not be able to satisfy all of the compliance requirements. We don't know encryption status for your NetDB record, but we can see that the machine is on the network, so that's bad. Okay, and oh, right. If a machine go, I did want to put in one plug for the network self registration service because one of the nice things. When you put a machine through Snoozer, that's how we pronounce it, either Snoozer or Snoozer, depending on who you ask. <clears throat> There's my voice coming. When you put a machine through the Stanford Network self registration process, we know that the information going into NetDB at that point is going to be accurate. We'll have a correct MAC address list, nobody will have mistyped anything. We will have just gotten the user's enrollment information, that's a good thing. And we added this maybe just about three years ago. Snoozer will put the machine's hardware serial number into NetDB. So for NetDB records that were created by Snoozer within the past few years, we will in fact see that we have a hardware serial number, which is nice because at least some days soon I hope that we'll be able to use that to do device matching in the right which will be more reliable to speak. Then the device registry calculates whether something is compliant. And I believe I have pretty much everything here other than the freshness of status. And what we're talking about here is just is this information current relative to the machine's last seen on network? We know when your computer was last seen on the network. We know at when the Valor or Bitrix agent last checked in. If there's more than a seven day difference, if the computer was seen on the network today, and the big fix agent didn't check in in more recently than eight days ago, the machine will be considered non compliant. And this would probably be a good time for me to mention, and I'm going to be wrapping up here very shortly. In fact, I'm wrapping up. Um, so, the machine, when you look at the My Devices device details record, and I think Shilpa will here in just a moment show you what that looks like. Um, you will see what you need to do right up at the top. It will say actions required. So when people are wondering what to do in order to bring a device into compliance, in my experience, very often, if you just do the stuff that it says by action required on the device details page in my devices for that machine, that will do the job. One of the most common things you see is you need to reinstall the big fix agent because it's not checking in. If you go, if you look at the device details page, you can see a timestamp for when the big fix agent last checked in. You can look lower down on the same page, see when the machine was last seen on the network, Okay, there's more than a seven days difference there. That's why the device is not compliant. Usually the solution is to reinstall the management agent, and that's what it tells you to do with the device details page. You look like you have something to say in the No, okay. Not right now. Not right now. Because there's there's more that could be said on the subject, but maybe 
you for not sure. right now. This sort of affiliation matters, exceptions will get you out of jail if you can make the case for an exception and the ISO will buy it. Which are is very difficult. Yes. They, they've gotten really, really good at saying yeah. no. So it basically needs to run equipment essentially or, or be cost is almost never a reason. Yeah. So that yeah. is that is very true. Yes. Compliance exceptions are not readily granted. No. And usually it needs to be some kind of really special purpose equipment. There are cases, more and more we've been dealing lately with some really intractable problems where the user has done absolutely everything she should do, everything she possibly could do to bring the device into compliance. And because our stuff, for some reason, isn't working properly, it's reported to be non-compliant. We don't really want to make people suffer unnecessarily. So we can, you know, in a case like that, we can get an emergency compliance exception or what have you. So there's there's always a way if there needs to be. Um, and things like the internet of things, uh, and things and so forth, those kind of devices we just don't even notice they tend not to show up on our devices. Ah, non-compliance notifications, and then I'm probably gonna wrap up. When the device becomes non-compliant, the first Tuesday after that happens, the person who is recorded as the primary user of the device will receive a notification saying the device is non-compliant. Some people notice, but some people don't. But this is the beginning of a 30-day countdown on that Tuesday. So on each successive Tuesday for the next four Tuesdays, the user will again receive a non-compliance notification. You get a final courtesy notice, I think, on the day before the day of. So it'll be on a Thursday, 30 days after that first Tuesday, that your NetDB node record for that device gets switched to the dubious state, which some of you might be familiar with. And that just means that your computer appears like it might be having some compliance issues or kicking it off the network until you can user do something about it. And um, that often does get people's attention. So um, <clears throat> along with the importance of getting your computer back onto the network. I, there's the new Cardinal Key service that Michael Duff was talking about on one of these, right, right, right there. Um, that's that's where everybody is right now. It's not where I would be too if I were you. But um, so the for a Cardinal Key to be usable on a given device, that device needs to be compliant. I haven't talked about it a whole lot, but. For compliance enforcement, it matters who you are and what your affiliation with the university is. So, for example, a lot of the rules that we've been discussing here don't apply to a great many students. Students in the medical school are special, students, staff are special. So, depending on your current role, there could be some variation. But um, not everybody's compliance status is going to be enforced. But for using Cardinal Q, Compliance always matters. You cannot use a cardinal key, a client certificate that allows you to do passwordless authentication. You're not going to be able to use it unless the device is compliant. And again, if the device is not compliant, even if you are not a mandated individual, you will now, this is a recent change, be able to go into My Devices, look at the device details page, look by actions required for a non compliant device, follow this remediation steps, and everything should be fine. I think I am probably more than done. Um, I'll leave the URLs up a bit, and I think Shilpa is going to give you just a very quick tour of the admin interface of my devices and say a few other things about what everybody can see in my devices. I know there are a few people in here who are my devices admins. A couple walked in away, so. Okay, so um, let me maybe. Thank you, Jay. And uh, so I think most of you would have seen or heard of my devices at some point. If not, this is my devices. And when you just log in into with your you know, username, password, the same single sign-on way, I mean, whatever Jay had said, like all the feeds come in, your device is synthesized, and it's associated with a person. That is how we show the list of devices in here. So anything that is shown here is it's yes, it's my device, it's your device. So and uh, let me actually take one of my devices and actually see uh, what all the things that we just spoke about, right? 
So my device, my laptop that I'm currently using, it's compliant. And as it's as I am the owner, I get to also remove my device. So assume you are switching your device. I mean, uh, I'm handing over it to Jay. So I think a good thing to do is to go here and say, okay, go to remove device and say, oh, this is no longer my computer. So that it actually is, you know, removing everything, you know, associating associating it with you. And then Jay can actually again go in and say, run the enrollment again, make sure the big fix is there and bring it back under his thing. So that's what remote devices. And all the things we spoke about, like model, name, type, serial number, operating system, encryption status, which also says what is the last time that the device you know, checked it. And when you, you know, lose your recovery key or when you want, like somehow don't have it handy, so this is where you go and you say, get your recovery key so that you can you get a one pass to get into your system actually so and all the hardware addresses you know different types which were reported by all the different types of sources the senate id who am i and what is the person that's associated to and this section is all about enrollment which is also you know when you run the snoozer or the snsr so this is the part that gets updated and assume you know at some point you know your device was not shared and then you run snoozer and say oh now it's gonna be shared so this is a section that gets updated where you know at this point it's not but it can change so that's when you run the snoozer to change the fields in here and not having to redo the whole of the registration process so does the device have access to high risk data and and then don't limit it and then we have all the management agents running. So as this is a laptop, we have big fix. If it's a mobile device, it will be MDM in there. And oh, it can have Velour also in here. But yes, big fix and Velour. Um, and, and this is all the auth log information. Basically, uh, when did I last see on the network, which is like today at 1.4 when I just logged in. And the enrollment information and um, the, and this is the NetDB record, and this these two are some fields which are specific to device registry and are unique to the device. So this is pretty much a you know a overview about what device details look like, and I also want to quickly. Um, could you show like maybe click on the the information button by the oh, yeah. devices because yes. one of the interesting things here is you can actually see which feeds provided specific yeah. values. So like in this case, so how yeah. much of Mac addresses? I think you said also earlier that if the device is not in compliance, you cannot connect to the network. Is that correct? If for, it has been. Yeah. So for thirty days, that's the time period that we give you once you have a non-compliant device. To bring it back into compliance, but once your time is elapsed, then we set the NetDB node to dubious. After that, you cannot connect to it. Work anymore. But how do you prevent that connection? Then EBS uh, kind of a gating factor. To yes, work. just just yeah. like after authentication. It, to, just to like with a new and unrecognized machine showing up on the Stanford network, yeah. a dubious system will be set back through network self registration. Okay. And at that point, you'll be prompted to download software that you can use to deal with the problem, whatever it might be. You can also connect to Stanford Visitor Wi-Fi. I guess yes, you can, can get it that way. Yes. So there's usually some way to get onto a network so that you can take whatever action is necessary in order to bring the device back into the point. So, so this is how you know, my mattress was reported right different systems and how we synthesized it to say, okay, all of these feeds and information is actually of this particular device. And that's when the row is created, synthesizing all of that information. So this can, you know, can always keep any of these eyes to actually see, uh, you know, if you go in here and say, oh, this is not the name that I put in, or this is not the MAC address, um, you know, it's not my device. So, that I would actually tell you which feed is actually you know, not reporting that information correctly, which would actually help you to you know, triage the problem from there or reach out to the right people. So and, uh, that is my devices. And we also have this admin functionality that 
GBC we are talking about. So if you're an admin in my devices mm -hmm. and and you want to triage a situation, so you can basically search for a device by a set of tiny or by a device search where you can search by a device ID or a reg ID, which is an internal identifier to uh, device registry. And you can search by a device name, a MAC address, and a phone number. And you can have a certificate search. Now that certificates are in the picture and you want to know who actually is the owner of you know, the certificate, associating it back to the device. And um, so that is a certificate search and we have the feed search. So when all of these feeds come in and we store it in the staging table, because we don't want to lose it when information is sent to us in a certain way. And because after that point, you are like synthesizing the feed into a device. So the feed search would actually give you an initial source of information, what did the system actually record it, and what did it become after that. So to, come, to give us that comparison, that's the feed search. So let me actually go and go and look at Jay's record. We have a lot of devices, FYI. So here it says, you know, who he is, what's his affiliation, and what is his mandate status. The reason we have mandate status is, as I was just saying, who you are in Stanford will tell you your mandate status. Like if you're a student, oh, you're not mandated. Um, like if you're a staff, yes you are. And if you're a combination in this case, the staffness would, you know, in this case as he's an active staff that would take over. So we have a set of tools in place there to say, okay, what is the highest rank affiliation of all the affiliations that you have? So that is the mandate status. And when it comes to devices, okay, let's go and take one non-compliant device and actually see if it's a good one, Jay? Yeah, it's been sitting in the drawer. Oh, no. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> so, and if it's an uncompliant device, this is how you, you're going to see your record. Um, as Jay was saying, these are all the actions that you should be taking in order to bring it back to compliance. Example, you know, run your enrollment. Um, you know, run it, run have either bit fix or well or install. Encrypt your device. Make sure your operating system is supported. So, all of that is done. Yes, it's going to bring back it to compliance. And it also has information on to when we notified you, and it also has you know, dates and um, the time frame that's associated with it. And I think we might have a question. Yeah, sure. sure. Do I have a no, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I so think. in this case, you know, it, it's, it's done. So that's when it sets the NDD note back to dubious. And I think. We just reset the counter back again. So in, by end of today, this will be again set to good for the next 30 days, right? Um, no. Oh, it's elapsed. No, okay, it's, okay. It's, no, yeah. No, it's, so it's, you're done. It's, it's, it's going to stay dubious. Yes. Okay. So, so this, this, is, a, this is a great example of what a computer looks like when it's been sitting in a drawer for 90 days. So if you have or, somebody coming back from a... Or a year in this case. Or a year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so if you have somebody coming back from an extended <laughs> vacation, uh, about half of those problems would be taken care of simply by virtue of putting the machine back onto a network where it can reach the big fix server. Yeah. So this machine had, actually I think that had Valor on it, but I need to put it onto a network where the Valor agent could check in, but then things would start falling into place and moment information would get reported, compliance status would be calculated, encryption stuff would not get That's been an issue for us with loaders. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have a stash of loader devices. And some of them sit for a while, and they, and if they're not heard from in a certain number of days, then they go not compliant. So, unfortunately, that means that we basically reboot or boot up the devices at yeah. least once a week. Right. Yeah. So well, it doesn't need to be quite that often, but, but it's yeah, you would want to have whoever's responsible for the loaners take them out of a drawer every once a month, or whatever, boot them yeah, up, yeah. let them apply patches and things. Yes. Well, yeah, and that's um, the other reason why we do it. Yeah. yeah. So that's why the patches. Yeah. How do you handle devices that have multiple OSs? It's because developers <coughs> generally use uh, Linux or some other right. tools. And so it is like a device having multiple identities, right? So how do you handle that? Yeah. So if it's an actually, if it's a multi-boot system where, um, you know, you, you boot up into a different primary OS when you, when you restart, we don't handle those terribly well. And it turns out not very many people at Stanford seem to be doing that anyway. Most people who I'm need to use 
Not anymore. <laughs> it, yeah, partly because we've, we've made it difficult. But yes, um, people generally use virtual machines if they want to run multiple OSs. That seems to be the usual practice. It's certainly what we encourage people to do. Because basically, it won't. It is possible to make them compliant. Like you can't have a boot cap machine that is compliant. Mm -hmm. It is non-trivial. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really hard, and it just does not. It is not worth the effort. They, they don't develop locally for the boot cap. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's yeah, that's right. You just you can't do whole disk encryption properly right. with a, a multi-boot system. So especially we, yeah, we, like really, Windows. we really just try to make it difficult for people to do that. And generally these days, a virtual Power, machine works. Machine quite well. hardware is powerful enough to do most everything virtually. You know. Yeah. So well, actually, when you're when you're talking about a Windows and Linux dual boot, the Linux is not. Uh, subject to compliance anyway. Okay. That is right. So really, as long as your Windows side is compliant, and that's that's, that's depending on how you format it, that's yeah. the part that's hard, right? Because you have to that that partition has to look like a whole disk <coughs> in order for Red that, to do its that's, thing. That's and, right. Yeah, that's really hard to do. <coughs> and you'll have a machine that might sometimes look like it's a Windows box in my devices, and might sometimes look like it's something else. Yeah. Or um, or now or, nowadays the recent. Uh, thing I've noticed is that you used to be okay with having like your primary system disk be encrypted, and then you had maybe like a second partition that wasn't encrypted, and that used to be okay. It's not okay anymore. I am, Everything has to be. I am glad you brought that Everything up. Has to be. So regarding regarding multiple internal fixed disks and encryption requirements, there's a little complexity here. For a Mac OS system, all internal fixed disks are required to be encrypted. Right. With Windows, no. Only the system disk is required to be encrypted. And the reason for this is the way the two OSs handle encryption recovery keys is quite different. On Mac OS, a single encryption recovery key can unlock any volume that was encrypted using you know, one user account and, and, and one system. Um, on Windows, on the other hand, each volume that you've encrypted has its own bit locker and recovery key, and we're just not tooled up to escrow those for people. And we don't want to tell people to do something to encrypt a drive, and we can't offer them a recovery mechanism. So that's what we would we would like for the requirements to be the same for both OSs, but for technical reasons, at the moment that just hasn't been practical. Right. So yeah, th thanks thanks for asking so, that. And it, uh, oh yes. So is this something that you have developed on your own, or is this a uh, bought from a, from a vendor? My devices is. Her work and and, and uh, her colleagues, yeah. yeah. And so. There is Amy, which is in the School of Medicine, which is um, extra fun because uh, <laughs> it can be because you have to have Amy and my devices both match. Yeah. Both be compliant, otherwise different things happen. Yeah, so we have the Amy data also flow in into my devices and also another component that is constant complex. Yeah. In med school requires at the station we have to tell it if you have personal devices, even if they're not on the network, on the separate network. So yeah. that that's another kind of wrinkle that a number of us here have dealt with. And that's cross checks against how many devices one shows up and devices yeah. and sometimes there's an extra thing there. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it, it is more it's complicated. Um because there are different requirements. But yeah, Amy is uh, Amy was kind of was first to the scene mm -hmm. and then my devices. Amy was first, um, and mm, yes, at the moment we have both. Maybe someday we, we shall see. Okay, um, if I, I, people are not flooding out the door, I, I we're totally out of time. So if you need to go, scoot. But I was there was you, you said Bond right that you had an actual ongoing current device compliance problem that maybe we could look at together. Would you be interested in doing that? Oh, I'm from the healthcare. Uh, oh, okay. Then, then maybe, then maybe. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. 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 That um, things aren't being synthesized as quickly as they used to. We've Just got some more issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 a lot of it. Uh, it seems to be helping. Yeah. 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 So we had some. Uh, for sure. Uh, uh, when you 
Um, what did you even say though? You're, it's, yeah, it's just time at this point. It's mm -hmm. just We're getting into more people. complex and a few particular time, which is taking yeah. uh, a lot more time than we But yes, we have um, we have actually almost come to a conclusion of the work. We have oh, okay. um, oh, oh, I and the back end, the back end is as well, yeah. right? Uh, actually, it's a combination. The, the, the initial staging yeah. database or MongoDB yeah. yeah. with so the sense. Sense. Uh, rock your, your data. No, possibly, but yeah. once it happens, the process is going into a core yeah. or working yeah, that most of my problems will yeah. be solved by that. IT it's because a lot of times, like they always do, they wait until the last minute or until they're kicked off the net. And then it's like, well, you're going to have to wait another four days. Thank you. So that would be huge.